will be happy or blessed. That's what we're going to talk about today in Matthew 5. Okay, so we were cooking along. We made it through Matthew 1 through 4. Everything is going great. And this whole experiment, this whole podcast is kind of layperson, read the Bible and understand what's going on. Obviously, there are some things that are going to be harder because they're tricky words, they're trickier theological concepts, but we hit our first one this time. If you haven't read it, go ahead and start reading Matthew 5. It's where we have what's called the Beatitudes. Remember, the chapter headings in the Bible were not part of the Bible. They were added later on. Someone cutely called them the be attitudes. These are the attitudes to be. Okay, that's cute. I don't think that's what the word beatitude means, but pretty nice. I think where people go wrong, or maybe even I went wrong, is sometimes I look at the beatitudes and I try to think, well, who am I in all of this? What, what best represents the kind of person I am? You know, and which again, sounds a little bit prideful, but where am I good at things and where am I bad at things? And I think this is not a checklist. This is not something that you're supposed to say, hey, this is my strength. I'm the mourner. I'm very good at mourning. Nope. Or the other way, I'm going to check all these things off of our list. What he's trying to tell us is these are the ways to act all the time. We should behave in these manners, and this is how we should live our life. Jesus is holding everyone from the lowliest person sitting on the mount and to us to the highest people. There were Pharisees and Sadducees were probably among the mixture. They were analyzing this with all their deep knowledge of things. He is saying this to everybody. We all need to do the same thing. And I think where people go wrong is when they look at the do's and don'ts of what Jesus tells us to do, they maybe think of God as someone who's trying to kill our fun or someone who's trying to make our lives this pious monastery thing. And he doesn't understand the kind of fun we want to have. God invented us and he invented this planet. He knows the best ways for us to live. And he is telling us in no unclear way, this is how you live. I, the writer of your instructions, your owner manual, I'm telling you, this is what goes best in your life. He is not making up rules just for the sake of putting rules on you. That's kind of what the Pharisees were doing. And that's why he's saying you're a pit of vipers. He is saying, as the creator of your body, this is how you should go about your life. He wants us to have this richness. He wants us to have this closeness. He wants us to inherit the kingdom of God. He wants us to be comforted, to have our daily needs met. He wants all these things for us because this is how we are truly happy. Again, blessed, the fortunate, the happy are these things. He is not telling us this to ruin our fun. He is trying to tell us these things so that we can gain happiness. Isn't that interesting that a God who created the universe, who sees the big picture of everything, still cares about our fundamental happiness and our fundamental needs being met? Pretty amazing. So the Beatitudes, or the blessed are, blessed is a word in Greek that means happy. Happy are the And so it says that he went up to his mountain. That was what happened the last time because he saw the crowd, but he wasn't escaping them. I think in my head, when you go up to these mountains, it gives you almost stadium seating, (laughs) well, reverse stadium seating, so that you'll be able to sit around the mountain and hear him. And so it says right off the bat, he opened his mouth and started teaching. So the first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay. What is the poor of spirit? I searched and I read and I researched a lot of different topics about this. And some people felt like it meant poor, that blessed are the poor. And it's not exactly true because this is poor of spirit. So then what does the word spirit mean? So then other people will say that means brokenhearted, but that someday they will be happy because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Think of more what they talk about breaking a horse. I don't want to sound really like that. It's kind of bad. But you're not spirited, meaning bucking God. Instead, you're meek. You're humbled. You're depending on everything with God. You're not depending on the world. You're not depending on the wealth, which then would indicate more poor. But everything you do depends on God. 
That's what it is. You're not talking about yourself. You're not talking about your position or your education or who you are. But instead, you are accepting God's grace as an unworthy, fallen short human being who needs grace in every step of the way. And of course, we know that if he was talking about the poor, a lot of people were poor at this time. Almost everyone was poor except a very small few. And we also know that from other passages like in Isaiah, that the same rules apply to the rich and poor alike. But in this case, the poor in spirit, I think, is that sense that we are depending on God. The next one says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so mourners are not just about death, but people who lament. I was thinking of Jeremiah who ripped his clothes and cried. He was the crying prophet because he weeped over the sins of his people. So I think, too, when it talks about people who mourn, I think we look at this world and we see the brokenness. And every time I see someone go out on TV and say something, I was just listening to someone talking about a music video that was out there and how he was glorifying sin and glorifying manly ways. I think for me, when I listen to this, it made me sad. It makes me sad when I see people buck, like I said, God, or go beyond him because they could have this life of richness in God and the everlasting life. And it gives me sorrow to see the world. I don't get mad. I don't get vengeful. I see people who yell at other people on the internet and other places, not saying that I'm this person, but just saying, I think that's what it means. That when we have that loss, that loss because of separation from God, that's what makes us sad. And so when we think about that, we think that God is the great comforter, not the blanket, but God is going to comfort us. He's going to give us what we need to overcome our mourning. So we will be comforted. The next one is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, that one's, I think, a little bit more simple than the other ones. Who are the meek? And again, those are people who are gentle. They don't assert what they think is right and wrong. They are not demanding of other people. It's that concept of turning the other cheek. Jesus said that he was meek and riding on a donkey. He could have rode in on a horde of angels steering a gigantic chariot. He didn't do any of that. This makes no sense to people. The Greeks and the Romans wanted strength and boldness. If you could not be bold, they didn't care about you. If you could not be warlike, and this is why they liked Herod so much. He was a strong man who sought vengeance on people, who put down anything that would throw his kingdom into jeopardy. This is not meek. And that's what God is saying here. And chapter six says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. I think, again, when you look at this world and you just see a place where there isn't righteousness, where there isn't the justice that we seek in eternity, you know, we know something is wrong here because there's that perfect image given. It makes me think of like uh, everyone now who says we're just biological creatures. We're just giant meat bags following out the orders of chemicals and electrical signals in our brain. And that God isn't real and there are no such things as standards, you know. But then how is it that we long for those things? If there are no standards, then murder is not wrong. Then hurting our brothers and sisters is not wrong. It is just survival. It is just getting our DNA to survive another generation. But instead, we hunger for righteousness and we hunger for justice and we look and we don't see it. That is where we'll be satisfied because Jesus will bring the ultimate righteousness to earth. And so that at that point, we'll get the thing we're looking for and we will get what we're hoping for. It makes me think of Jesus who at the well says that he has a water that will never make you thirsty again. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. We're going to see many times in what Jesus says where he talks about you will get what you give. We're going to talk next chapter even about the Lord's Prayer and that we hope God forgives us like we forgive other people. Now we want mercy like we give mercy to other people. But the real question is, 
Are we giving mercy to other people? Do we really want to get the mercy we give? Or do we want the mercy that God gives and we want to do what we want to do? So in order to get the mercy from other people, we want to give mercy, which is compassion and care, charity for other people. The next one is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart, those are the people who have that inner ability to see the right and the wrong. They have a sense of true north when it comes to God and what God wants. They find God in the world because they see what is the right thing, the right way to go. You can tell there are people who get, who get this. They, they are able to see the rights and wrongs in the world. The most of the rest of us, what we do is we look at the ruts. I always joked about how when I go biking, if I look at the rut that's in front of me, don't go in the rut, don't go in the rut, don't go. Nine times out of 10, I'm going to go right into the rut. Because what we see is what we go after. Instead of going out there and seeing the pure, going after the pure, we're instead looking at all the bad in the world. See that over there and see this over here. And we're pointing our fingers when instead our focus should be on the pure, on the light. And it's not going to be selfish, but we are going to speak honestly because of our pure in heart ways. The next one are, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be sons of God. And I think that the reason that the pure in heart see God is because God is pure. When they look towards God and not at the rut, they see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus was called the Prince of Peace when we're talking about prophecy in Isaiah. But we see the devil trying to destroy any form of peace. He wants war, conflict, brother fighting against brother. Mother fighting against daughter. Conflict is what it's all about. Every time there's conflict on this planet, the devil is there beaming pride. That's what he's looking for. But when we see peace, when we see de-escalation, when we see bringing the gospel in and overcoming evil with good, that is peace. It also means that if you yourself are a fighting person, a person who battles other people, can, can you bring peace? That's an interesting question. And they are called sons of God because they're doing God's will by seeking peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And those are going to be people, and we could probably list a whole bunch of them in our heads, of people who have been persecuted and suffered because of Jesus. People who stood up for the faith. People like Bonhoeffer, who stood up as a Christian against the Nazi dominion and what they were seeking and lost their lives because of it. We think of the apostles. Every single one of them died in faith. The only one I think that ended up not executed was John, who was exiled and then died in old age alone on an exiled island. Everyone who speaks that truth gets persecuted. Jesus told his apostles they would suffer. Must have made him sad. Many of us may suffer too. And that's where we look at this society and think, do we just go along to get along? Do we just go with the flow because we don't want to provoke fights? Do we just want to back down from what God tells us the Bible is about because we don't want to stand out? We don't want to stand up for God? This is knowing there will be persecution. And Jesus never said anything but that. He wants us to know the kingdom of heaven is ours. Blessed are you. When others revile you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so this is the last of the blessed ours, the Beatitudes. And this follows directly in behind the last one. People are persecuted for righteousness. And again, we've seen that in history. We see it today. What happens to people when they stand up for God, where they stand up for God's word, and they stand up for the things that God asks us to do, they're reviled. So he wants you to know you're in good company because so were the prophets. The prophets also experienced all of this. Your reward is going to be in heaven. So that's the Beatitudes. But now you think that's enough. That's enough teaching right now. But nope, we're going to go on because then Jesus goes on to say, that you are the salt of the earth. And so the idea is that salt, first of all, was extraordinarily valuable up to modern times. 
wars and battles were lost because there was no salt. The, the army that had more salt and could preserve meat usually won. So when he says, you are the salt, you are valuable. But if the salt loses its saltiness, I was trying to think, how does salt lose saltiness? Gets diluted, right? If you put it in a lot of water, like the salt in the ocean is very dense. It's a lot of salt. But I go over to Lake Superior and I pour a cup of salt in Lake Superior. It's not salty anymore. You won't taste salt. It'll blend in with the whole rest of it. So if we just toss it out, we dilute it, people step all over it because it's on the ground, we've lost our saltiness. We've lost this value. And he says that we're the light of the world. I've mentioned this in my other podcast, Small Steps with God. I love this passage because, first of all, if you are light, there's nothing else you have to do. You just have to shine in public. It says that you don't put it under a basket, but instead you put it out someplace so a whole house can see your light. And in the same way, we should do that to other people. And I say this in my speeches and when I do presentations, that light was extraordinarily expensive. They said something, this article I was reading, in 1950 BC, it took 400 hours to work for one hour of light. That would be 33 days for one hour of light. Now, our cost of light per hour is under a second. So you can see that at the time of Jesus, it was probably still very expensive. They used primarily olive oil, which is something you also eat. So the more light you put in your world, the less you're eating. Valuable. You would never light a candle that is so expensive and so valuable and then hide it under a basket so no one can see it. It's really weird and no one would do that. And so this is funny because there's no action you have to take. You have to just not hide it. He wants us to know that he did not come to abolish the law, remove it from us. I think that people wanted the law to be gone. There's a lot of law that people followed. And if you were a Pharisee and you tried to follow all of it as best you could, it's very hard work. But what he's saying is he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and that every dot, every piece of ink that is put on a parchment that not one dot of it will be removed until the law is accomplished, which means that Jesus comes to fulfillment. So if you relax, he says, even one of the least of these commandments that God teaches, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So before, you know, people were being blessed in the kingdom of heaven, and now they're the least because they don't do what they're told to do. But everyone who does these things will be great in the kingdom of heaven. And then he says something interesting. Unless our righteousness exceeds the the smart people, the scribes, the Pharisees, the people who are studying this and are educated in this, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. I think God's preaching about this goes into two buckets. One bucket is how can we live a successful life? The other bucket is what do we need to do in order to reach heaven? Now he's starting to bring in that second message. The other messages were about how to be successful here on this planet. But here we're talking about not fulfilling the law, not doing what God says and falling short will mean we'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. But this is where Jesus has come to save us instead of leave us stranded. We can't. We will never do it. We are impossible to do it, but we should try because our life should produce good fruit. We should do whatever we can to fulfill God's law. In the end, we reach heaven not because we did a great job, but instead because God saved us. A lot of this, what he's talking about, and even in the passage before us, he is talking directly against the people who were the leadership. The Sadducees were aristocrats. They were high up. They were high up in the temple structure. They had a good with Rome. They were doing good things, but they didn't really believe in anything after the first five books of the Torah. And he had the Pharisees who were trying to do every dot and iota, but were failing. And in order to do what they were doing, they ended up putting more rules around rules, which you think, oh, that makes sense. So the idea is if we're supposed to honor Sabbath, when is Sabbath? We don't want to screw this up and not honor Sabbath. So then they would say, oh, it's when three stars appear in the night sky, that Sabbath which I think at the beginning had good intent. You know, you want to prevent people from living 
a bad life or screwing up one of the laws. But unfortunately, they got things wrong. Secondly, they were starting to do this in order to skate the law. So now he talks about anger. It says that anytime you had anger in your heart towards your brother, whoever insults them, whoever calls them a name, you're in trouble. You are liable for the hot fires of hell. You are liable for murder. But obviously murder is a much more serious crime, but it's the same crime in that same vein. And it says it's so bad that if you have something against your brother, don't go at that point and give at the altar of God, but instead reconcile, come to an agreement, come to some sort of forgiveness. Because what was happening is that they were coming up with these rules, but now the rules weren't just to save them from sin. It was almost protecting them from thinking they were sinning. So you would say, well, I hate my brother, but at least I didn't murder him, so I'm not sinning. You know, they were getting around these. Or could we stone him very nearly to death, which is apart from murdering him, which would be putting him to death? So what's the fine line of murder? So I don't murder my brother and I'm not guilty of a sin, but yet I made him suffer enough. She's saying, don't do that. Reconcile. Same thing with lust. If you have lust at looking at a woman, you've already committed adultery. Again, not the stringent level of adultery. Not exactly the same as adultery, but it caused you to sin. And so he's saying this is so devastating that if any of your body parts, your eye causes you to sin, get rid of it. And if your right hand causes you to sin, get rid of it. Because it's better that we would lose this body part than face the fires of hell. However, again, he's not asking us to throw our body parts into the fire. He is saying sin is so devastating. It's so terrible that you should do everything you can to get away from it. It is so important that you do that, that you have pure love for other people, other women, other people's daughters and their sisters and their mothers. It is so important that your body parts are not even as important than it is to stay away from sin. And again, I think he's getting to the Pharisees who are trying to figure out, well, what exactly is adultery? I remember when we were in college, we were talking about that. Well, wait a minute. What exactly is, you know, sleeping with someone or having sex with someone or, you know, committing the, the sin of adultery? Is it holding hands? Is it kissing? You know, and so we were trying to find some sort of fine line that says, yes, this is the part where sin starts and this is the part where sin ends. And that's the, what Jesus, I think, is preaching against. This is about what's in your heart. You can lust in your heart and commit that. It is not about, well, it is about your actions, but it's not just about your actions. It's about your intentions, about what you are thinking about. And that's the problem. And that's what we have to address. So you Pharisees who are coming up with these rules doesn't work because you have to go back much farther than that. I was listening to Pastor Mike Novotny on his podcast the other day, and he was saying something about he doesn't know that the first time you look at something, you look at someone with anger, you look at someone with lust, that's the sin. First, you're just going, wow, you know, that guy's gorgeous. It's the time you look the second time. That's the problem. Now you've given into temptation. It's not just an observation. Oh, what that person did to me was pretty terrible. Observation. But now when you think about it again, you know what? You should punch him. Now you've gone into the wrong territory. It's always that second take that brings you into the moral part of it. Then he talks about divorce. Divorce was something that was issued under Moses. Do this out of what was considered to be a convenience because people were falling away and they weren't doing it. But here Jesus is saying, no, that's not true. Even though it happens, when you divorce your wife, if she marries again, you will make that person and your wife a, a, adulterers because she got married again. And women at that time had very little choice. They could own no land. So they had to get married just to even feed themselves. And that's a hard thing to accept because we think of people getting divorced all the time. I mean, it was rare when I was a kid. Now it's often, you know, and people were talking about the slippery slope. Well, if we make it easier for you people to get divorced and people get divorced all the time, slippery slope. 
Well, it turned out to be true. People get divorced all the time. This is supposed to be forever. And again, the Pharisees were making rules. Well, if I do this and if I do that and I divorce her in this way or that way, it's fine. It's not fine. This marriage is meant to be forever. Oh, people have gotten big into this oath. I've met people who will not swear any oath, including to the military or something like that. It something that should be taken seriously. You don't say, I swear by this or I swear by that. Instead, you should just say yes or no. Yes, I'll do this thing. Or no, I won't do that thing. When people are swearing oaths, the promises should only be made if you are absolutely going to do them. And the Pharisees at that time felt that they could swear oaths, and it was fine if they didn't keep them as long as they didn't swear by God. So they were just saying, I swear to you as your sister, I shall do this thing. And then they didn't have to do it. They didn't say the word God. And so they didn't have to do it. And they say, don't do that. Just say yes or no. See why we're having such a thick podcast this week? It's very deep. So then comes the part about retaliation. We're not supposed to seek revenge. We turn our cheek, which means if someone smacks you on the left, you turn your cheek and you let them smack you on the right. If someone wants to take your shirt, give them two shirts. If someone tells you to go a mile, go the extra mile. But instead of being retaliatory, vengeful, not doing the thing. Instead, just do it. Just go ahead and do whatever it is that's being asked of you. Again, as long as it's not being crossing over into bad things. And this were people under Roman Empire who were being told to do things all the time. But he's saying, in this case, you should volunteer. And this is redeeming it. You're bringing a good thing to an evil thing. That's a hard lesson to follow for sure. Love your enemies. So he says, you know, everyone loves their friends. That's easy peasy. We love our friends. We love our family. We love the people we love. But we shall love our enemies. We should love the people who persecute us. That shows us exactly the kind of love that God shows to us. Should we love the tax collector? Should we love people who do bad things to us? It says God sends rain to the just and the unjust. I mean, Life is going to happen to everyone, good or evil, and that we should love our brother. And God is perfect. We should be perfect. And we should love everybody. And we're going to see in Jesus' ministry him doing that in action. Again, another hard lesson. It's easy to love the people we love, but it's hard to love the people who do bad things for us. And then the end of the chapter, the last statement, which is uh, verse 48. You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The one thing we can't do is be perfect, but it's the one thing God calls us to do. But don't worry, help is on the way. Whew, well, that was a lot of content. I think the Beatitudes are one of the most read pieces in the scripture. People know them, even if they're not Christian. But it's interesting to see the reactions of some people. Nietzsche said in his Genealogy of Morals that meekness embodies what he calls a slave morality. Instead of good versus evil, instead it's who's in charge and who is a slave. So he did not like this one bit. I don't think the Romans liked it one bit either. So who is in this chapter? We know that the Jesus was there, the crowd, and the apostles. So the apostles that he had were all in this chapter. Some key words are blessed, first of all, fortunate, happy, are allusions towards things that you are, that you cannot become. You are salt. You are light. You don't become those two things. All you have to do is not toss it away. And then in general, we see this lecture of what should happen as a fighting about what the powerful or what the scribes are saying, the Pharisees are saying in the time that you don't break laws because you've murdered someone, you also break it because you're angry at them. You don't just break the laws because you commit adultery, but also because you look upon someone lustfully. You don't just divorce someone because you want to. When you divorce someone, it turns their actions into sinful actions. Your sinfulness causes sin in other people. You don't swear oaths because you think you can break them. You can't. You just say yes or no instead. You don't retaliate against people. You don't hate your enemies. You love your enemies. 
So it, he is countering the message that people would have heard all around him. He's using this lesson to tell people, you got it all wrong. I'm not starting a new religion. You weren't doing it right. So what does this chapter say about the nature of God? It says that he wants us to be holy, and he doesn't want to hold back the light and the salt that God gives us, but instead show it. He doesn't want us fighting over this is right and this is wrong because this is iota of a sliver between murder and anger or lust. Instead, he is trying to talk to people about what's in their heart. So his desire is for us to live a life of happiness, which means we're going to go in the way God asks us to go in and we're not going to buck. But what does it say about humans? I think the message of humans in this story is that we will actively take a gift of God being salt and light and hide it away or trash it entirely. We see the nature of humans that we will try to go through every split hair, every iota between this and that to try to not consider ourselves to be sinful. Well, I didn't hate my brother. I just punched him, but I wasn't hating him. You try to split hairs, they call it and think that you're getting away with something. You're not. And so the central message of this chapter is about who it is that's going to be happy, how it is we should live our lives, how it is that we should not live our lives, and how our intentions are just as important as our actions about what we do. And so what does God require us for to do? Well, gosh, this is funny because God requires us Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He's telling us in the end. And that's going to be stunning because we can't. And the Pharisees who think, well, no, 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 you don't have to be perfect. This is how you skirt the law. Instead, God is asking us to be perfect inside and outside. And then he's going to tell us in later chapters what it is that we have to do in order to account for that because we can't be that. I meditate on what God says will make me happy and how hard I try to get to those things. Next, I'm going to pray for him to show me how to be happier in his path. What can I do to amend my life to gain the things that he says we should try to gain? And what I'm going to share with other people is what God is really after. We get into these ideas of what God demands of us. The whole world is filled with these conceptions much like the Pharisees who thought they were getting it right, trying to get it right, but were really wrong. God is trying to tell us what he actually is seeking from us. All right, so that ends our very dense Matthew 5. There's a lot of things going on in here. You know, I was cooking along just fine through Matthew 1 through 3, and then all of a sudden we hit the Beatitudes. Next week we're going to hit the Lord's Prayer. And then the week after that, we're also going to do some additional teachings. So we've hit the meat of it. (laughs) How are we doing? I hope you're doing well. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Mm -hmm.